Hello, Internet, and welcome to the Science of. Using sci-fi and the news to educate people on how science actually works here in the real world. I'm here at the Natural History Museum, and I come across monkeys and rams and zebras and stuff. All things you would see in African plains. And I'm thinking about how such life can develop in such an environment. Yes, yeah, sometimes they're tempered, but a lot of times they can be rough. And the plains of Africa seem to be nearly as harsh as here in the desert. Probably the closest analog to here in the desert. My brain goes to how life would develop here in the desert because no water. <laughs> so how could life develop in the desert where I live? And why would anybody build a city here in the desert? Also, why would be pulled to build a city in the plains of Africa? Or maybe the fields of Australia? Because look, kangaroos. Australia. And then we realize, hey, a lot of money could be made for people who set up camp in the desert or in the plains because it's a long trip going through without any resources to restock your supplies. So find a way to have stock and water replenishing your outpost and you can make a lot of money, which requires a lot of ingenuity, a lot of intelligence, and a lot of balls. Also money. You need a lot of money for that as well. You can also make a lot of money hunting stuff like lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. And then we get to the flying species of deserts and plains, like the ostrich, falcons. Uh, this is definitely the southern part of Africa right here because uh, these are African penguins. And my mind goes to what prompted this species of penguin to go to Africa. I mean, they're on the far extreme south tip of Africa. But Africa nonetheless. It must have been a long swim for them, millions of years ago. And my brain goes to how strange evolution is for at least a few uh, members of the species to survive long enough to reproduce and have the species as a whole survive long enough to reproduce enough generations to evolve into what we know now as the southern African penguins, because it must have taken quite a few generations for them to adapt to such a warm climate as the southern tip of Africa. Now we get to the aqueous part of the museum and my brain goes to how fantastic the oceans of the world are to hold something as just vast as the great whale and as small as plant life. Not a whole lot of people think about plant life anywhere. Not much in the sea, not much here on land, or any time throughout history. Not a whole lot of people give enough of a mind to plant life anywhere. Even though it was the first multicellular life, and even though it's the form of life every other species on the planet wholeheartedly depends upon to, you know, stay alive. My attention gets drawn to the lionfish. Innocent and goofy looking. Some people think these guys are beautiful. I can't really say I much blame them. Give it a few minutes of thought and it starts looking goofier but still beautiful at the same time. Think about how poisonous they are. If you get stung by one of these, the most likely outcome is nausea and breathing problems, but nine times out of ten you won't die. But it could happen, it's been known to happen. My thought goes to how something so goofy looking can be so dangerous and cause so much pain. I mean, their poison is mainly for defensive purposes, but they still don't like to use it. They much prefer hiding and doing their camouflage thing and making themselves look like their environment so that predators don't see them in order to touch them. But if they do see them, bam, poison. Speaking of predators, that's where my mind goes next. The predators of the sea. Sharks and stingray. And I'm thinking about how there's kind of an escalation of sorts in the evolution of predators and prey. How prey has to evolve to avoid detection of predators, to defend against predators, to prevent themselves from getting eaten by predators. And how predators in kind have to evolve skills in order to detect uh, their prey and get around the defenses of their prey in order to eat them because eating is how you survive as a predator or as a prey. And I think that's beautiful in a way. It's amazing how life works here on Earth. And with that, we're off to the dinosaurs, the era that everybody is obsessed with. And I get to the epic battle of the Triceratops and the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And my first thought is how, while this is a classic battle in American thought, they weren't even around at the same time. I have since done a little bit of research and realized these two species were around at the same time, and I don't know where I heard that they were of two different ends of the dinosaur spectrum, but that goes to show that anybody can be wrong, and you have to be honest with yourself as to whether or not you can be wrong, and when things show you that you are wrong, you have to accept the fact that you are wrong. And I get to the feathered guy, who looks kind of like what I think paleontologists believe the raptor must have looked like. Uh, something that's been shown like two or three years after the first Jurassic Park movie was put into theaters. It's not a uh, raptor, however, because it's uh, 
Dino Nychus? Dino Nychus. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Because they mentioned I'm a chemist, not a paleontologist. <laughs> Give me a chemical name and I can pronounce it with ease. Give me one of these names, not so much. And once again, my brain goes to how, when looking at nature, not a whole lot of people tend to look at the plants underfoot. It's a shame that animals take precedent over plants simply because we are also animals. And if you don't think that humans are in the animal kingdom, then you need to read more. My point here is that humans should diversify their mentalities about looking at nature. It's not only about the animals. It's also about the plants and everything that is not life. Such as the dirt, the air, the clouds. Everything is a part of nature. And I remember that this nature is why I went to school to become a chemist. Because I want to help try to preserve nature try to bring nature back to its full glory because we are doing so much to harm it. It's a shame that we are destroying nature on such a massive scale because of pollution and harvesting and all of our activities that we feel we have to do because we want pieces of technology like this camera that I'm recording this on or, or the phone or, or the computer that you're watching this on because of our seeming need for these toys. We feel the need to perform actions that we don't even really realize is destroying the planet. And I want to preserve nature. Without nature, we die. We go extinct without nature. I'm thinking how if we allow the destruction of the environment, the destruction of nature, then we will go the way of these dinosaurs. Because as much as we love to think that we have the knowledge to do what we want, we can't really do much without nature. We will not have the resources to implement our knowledge. And with that I get to the rock room, which has greats such as gypsum and gold ore and bauxite and quartz and everything we need for our modern societies everything we are drilling from the ground. All of the resources which we're running out of because of our exploding population. After all, we do need copper ore to create copper wire to get electricity from the power plant to your home in order to view this video now. To get to the restaurant to make the food that you're paying them to eat. It'll eventually get to the point where we need to make a decision. Either we need to start harvesting from landfills or we need to start synthesizing all of these materials exclusively in a lab. Because we can't find them in nature anymore. Or they'll just become too expensive to harvest from the environment. And so we'll start harvesting from landfills or making the materials in the lab. As my camera starts to run very low on storage space, making me no longer able to capture a video, we get to the Egypt section. My brain starts to think about how we started all of this as a species. Large buildings such as pyramids, the concept of a city, really planned out agriculture, all of it. Everything that makes modern society what it is. All the necessary elements of modern society. Everything that led to the Industrial Revolution. And I start to think about how all of this was just innocent enough. Global warming, global climate change, all of this began in Egypt. It's a simple, directionless start. And nobody knew some 7,000 years ago in Egypt that things would get this bad. But alas, it did. Only if the kings of Egypt back then had foresight, maybe they would have geared society differently. Or maybe the leaders of the Industrial Revolution might have done something differently if they knew that the population would explode in just a couple centuries. Or maybe, just maybe, they would have prevented the technologies which prompted the population growth that they did. But it's too late now, isn't it? The things we see here led to the Industrial Revolution, which leads to climate change and global warming and global resource depletion and the sixth great extinction which is coming. So with all this in mind, I think we're better off if we actually start becoming sustainable, both on an individual level as well as on a societal level. And the societal level means both in law as well as in corporate mentality. Because let's face it, capitalism depends on the environment. And if corporations cannot be sustainable, then their profits cannot be sustainable because their profits depend on whether or not we can harvest the materials for the products which they sell to us. So if we cannot be sustainable on a resource level, then we cannot be sustainable on an economic level. And we'll just end up in a museum of us, four aliens reminiscing on this extinct species, which they call human. So subscribe to stay informed, don't forget to like, favorite, and share this video. Follow me on social media, links in the description. And as always, 
Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep improving the world around you.